even if you need the regular uh, thanks everybody for being here this is the first ever event to do yourself event as you see we're still preparing ourselves but I'd like to thank Andrew for being here he was very kind he accepted my invitation to come and talk to you uh, so at least we could give him a hand for being here I don't think I need to introduce you to Andrew. Uh, I'd like to thank Bobo Q for providing this place to us for free. Uh, I think we just just jump to the conversation. Sure. I'm not going to make any assumptions about people knowing what it is I do and who I am, so I'm going to us some familiar faces again, which is nice to see again. Um, so my name is Andrew Dubber, and I work at a university, um, and my job title is Reader in Music Industries Innovation. Uh, and Reader is kind of a fancy way of saying almost but not quite smart enough to be a professor. Um, and, but my job is I run an email in the music industries and another one in music radio. Radio is my background. I worked in radio for about 15 years before I became an academic, which I guess is what I've become now. Um, but alongside of that, for the last six or seven years, I suppose, um, I've been researching and writing about music online, which is really interesting to me. I, I've run a record label. Um, an independent jazz record label in Auckland, New Zealand in the late 90s, which is not the greatest get-rich-quick scheme in the world. Um, but I have ended up being really, really interested in independent music, uh, independent music business, alternative culture, and the ways in which that intersects with the online environment in what I call the digital age. So. Um, I've been writing, actually I've been back in the radio headspace for the last few months. I've been writing a book called Radio in the Digital Age, uh, which is a very similar title, and I'm just sort of coming to the end of that, but a very similar title to another book that I'm sort of partway through writing, but which you can already get, uh, called Music in the Digital Age. And the idea with Music in the Digital Age, it's not a traditionally published book. It's, a, it's an e-book that you can uh, go and download, pay whatever you want, um, from zero to, you know, you empty your bank account into my bank account, it's entirely up to you. Um, but it's a work in progress. So you buy it or you download it for free, whichever you prefer, uh, and you get where I'm up to. Uh, and as it updates and as I kind of contribute more to it and, and kind of the next update schedule for um, sort of late February or March, I guess, is, is kind of what I'm on target for, you'll just get the next bit. So hopefully while you're reading that, I should be able to stay a chapter ahead of you. Um, that's the theory anyway. Um, but Music in the Digital Age is based on some feedback I got from a book that I wrote about four years ago now, I guess, maybe more, um, maybe five, called The 20 Things You Must Know About Music Online. Now, The 20 Things You Must Know About Music Online was a free PDF that I gave away on my website, uh, newmusicstrategies.com. And the idea of that was, I got asked to do something very, very like this, only with far fewer people. Um, and there was a panel of us, and we were sitting there, and we were just saying, you know, these are the things that you need to know about the internet if you're an independent musician. Um, and so I came all prepared and everything, because, you know, in those days I used to prepare for these things rather than just turn up and, and make stuff up on the spot, which is kind of what I'm doing now. Um, but I wrote these little kind of cards, cue cards, just like, talk about this, talk about this, talk about this. And I had about 23, 24 of them. Um, and I got through the first couple and they said that's actually all we've got time for it's somebody else's turn now so I said what I'll do is I'll write a blog post about each of these things that I need to tell you guys about and uh, then you can just read them as you see fit and somebody said to me well I don't actually want to read your blog uh, can you just you know once you finish put them all in a PDF and send it to me and I thought well actually it's fair enough um, and that's an easy way to write a book uh, so I got it down to 20 uh, nice round number and also removed some duplication but I ended up with what I called at the time the 20 things you must know about music online. But the problem when you do something like that, because the internet moves really fast, it's like I was talking about MySpace and I was talking about, you know, uh, just stuff that seemed really new and exciting at the time. I might have even used the word cyber at one point, um, which, which kind of dates really, really quickly. Um, and so I'm always kind of, at the back of my mind, it's like, I need to update this, I need to do a new version, of you know, the new 20 things you must know about music online or 20 more things you must know about music online, or you know, just something to kind of not be suddenly and uh, dramatically irrelevant. Um, and I struggled with it. Like, I, I started writing this, this new 20 Things ebook a number of times, and just thought, this is nonsense. And I threw it away, and I started caring less and less 
about how do I promote my music on the internet? How can I be famous on the internet? How can I make money online? And I've got to the point now where I don't care about that stuff. Um, I'm not interested. If the, the, if the question I'm asked is how can I be famous on the internet, the answer is I don't care. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't use what I say in order to help you do that. It's just that's not the bit that I'm trying to solve. Um, but backpedal a little bit. I was in the Netherlands uh, visiting a friend of mine, Lekla, who Thomas knows. And uh, we were doing a kind of a, a workshop seminar like this with some of the local musicians there. And one of the people there said to me, if you wrote that book now, what would be different about it? I thought, it's a really good question, because I hadn't thought about it like that. I thought, how do I update the old book rather than if I wrote it now, what would it be? And I thought, actually, that's a really good question. So I thought about it, and I thought, well, actually, there wouldn't be 20 things you need to know. There's only one. And actually, from that one thing, you can extrapolate all of the other stuff that comes from that, and a whole lot more besides, um, and in a much more useful way. And my kind of my thinking was, if you just understood this one thing about, you know, music online, or in fact anything online, uh, then the rest of it just kind of unfolds for you, and you can kind of do whatever it is that you need to do. And the one thing was, this is a conversation, and it, and it seems like a really kind of inane, simplistic an oversimplified way of looking at the internet, but it is just human beings talking to each other. And as soon as you kind of understand what that means, you go, well, I know how to have conversations with people. I know how conversations work. I know that, like, for instance, conversations in a pub, a place like this maybe, you don't stand on a chair and go, look at me, I'm amazing. Uh, check out my new album, come to my thing, look at my video. You, you talk to people, you introduce yourself. You're not the nutter who's shouting in the corner. You're you're somebody with whom people have conversations. And as soon as you kind of make that shift, you get better, like dramatically better at using the internet. You become some, somebody who is interesting rather than, you know, shouty guy to be avoided. Um, which is kind of a really handy starting point. But also, when you think about conversations, you start thinking about how do people have conversations with each other. And I talk differently to my grandmother than I would to the guy who runs the shop down the road. So you have these context-relevant types of conversations, and you sort of you come up with different kind of ways of thinking about things like this. So all of the kind of the technical stuff, I guess you'd say, which was in the original book, the 20 things you must know about music online, um, you can actually deduce all of that stuff from that one principle, which isn't changing, because those things will become irrelevant. But the fact that the online space is a conversational space doesn't change. Now, what's been really useful is I've, I've sort of stepped away from the uh, Music in the Digital Age book to write this Radio in the Digital Age book. And Radio in the Digital Age is an academic book. Like I, it's the kind of book that I would look at and just glaze over. I do not recommend it. It's very, very boring. Um, but one of the things that I came to understand through writing Radio in the Digital Age is that there are different ways in which we communicate in different contexts. Um, and this idea of ages is the really interesting thing. The, the music in the digital age is not about digital music any more than radio in the digital age is about digital radio. Radio in the digital age can be analog, it can be wind up, it can be crystal set, but it's in the digital age. Music in the digital age can be somebody sitting at home with their computer switched off playing an acoustic guitar. It's still happening in the digital age. It's the age that's digital and that's what's different. And the way in which that kind of environment works as a kind of a piece of communications technology not just when you're communicating with other people, but the entire environment within which you work. The thing that was used to make your acoustic guitar had digital components to it. The, the, the sales mechanism through which you bought it was a transaction that happened digitally. You know, all of these things, the, the, the entire environment is a digital one. And that kind of oversees the way in which we think, the way in which we kind of communicate with each other, and the way in which value is created, which is really interesting, I think. Um, anyway, that's the premise of, I guess, both books in a very, very different way. So, how do you make that practical, I guess, is kind of the, the step. So I've got this Music in the Digital Age book, which I could just kind of truck out as a speech and just say, these are the things that you need to know, this is what it's all about. But actually, you can just go and read it. And it won't cost you anything if you don't want it to, or if you like it, you can give me money. Over to you. But, so rather than me just tell you what's in the book, I'm kind of more interested in going, well, how can you use that? You know, how can you guys take something away and take, make that kind of a more um, applicable concept? What should I then do? 
knowing that this is a conversational space, knowing that uh, I need to connect with my audiences. Uh, what is the model for making money out of, I guess you guys are here because you want to make money out of music in the digital age. Is that fair? Because I, I know that that's not everybody's conversation that they want to have. Uh, not everybody is about how can I make money from my music. You know, in fact, most music that happens in the world happens not for money. You know, like the vast majority of music that happens in the world happens not for money. Um, but there are some people who decide, you know what, I want this to be my career, I want this to be my profession. And so whenever there's any kind of public discourse about music, it's always in the context of where does the money go, who's got the money, how can I get the money, etc. So I'm kind of aware that, that, that people come to things like this going, you know what, I have less money than I would like to, I would like more money than that. Uh, and I would like to do it by playing music, recording music, promoting music, being a manager, running a recording studio, whatever it might be. But, but being involved in music, I want that to be not just the thing that I like, but the thing that makes me not have to do things that I don't like and still be able to eat. Um, and so that's kind of where I approach this from. But the problem is there isn't a model. There isn't an answer. I can't tell you these are the things that you do in order to make money in the digital age because whatever I tell you will be wrong for everybody but one person in this room. Uh, in fact, it will probably be wrong for everybody in this room. It will be right for one person on the planet because the thing about the conversational space is it's a negotiation. Uh, and it's a negotiation between what it is that you do that makes meaning for people and what it is that they do that generates meaning from what you do. Let's say you're a musician, you play the guitar, you're in a band, you sing, uh, you make nice noises, and there are a bunch of people who like them already. Okay, so there is that kind of, already there's a space there where you have an audience and you have uh, a thing that you do that they like. But the question you've got to ask yourself, how do they make meaning from my music? And how can I help them make that meaning from my music in a way that makes them want to give me money? Or makes me want to have, you know, makes them want to be engaged in the process where money happens, with or without them. How can I get them to tell their friends about me? How can I be communicatable? Uh, communicatable, I guess is kind of the word I'm looking for. Um, because in the online space, there are two types of things. There's the conversation, and then there's the things about which the conversation is taking place. Right, so you can either be talking to people, or you can be the thing about which they're talking. Um, but the easier thing to do is make things that people have conversations about. Uh, in the book I talk about them as social objects, although that's not actually my phrase. But if you make things, I mean, you know how YouTube works, you know how Facebook works. People don't just connect with each other, they connect about things. But there's a really good example, the, the, I think it's in the top three now, it used to be the single most viewed piece of video footage of all time was this thing called Charlie Bit My Finger. You guys come across that? <laughs> right, okay. As a piece of broadcasting, it's nonsense. You know, if you take it back to the electric age when it was television and radio and recordings and all the rest of it, you imagine these guys, a bunch, bunch of suits uh, in a sort of 17th story boardroom, sitting around the table, and one of them says, I've got this great idea for a show. We'll get this one kid to bite this other kid, and that kid will cry. He can't fail. And he'd be thrown out for being an idiot. And yet, this is a piece of video that is the, you know, one of, if not the, single most watched pieces of video content of all time. Um, and so what is it about that that makes it not good broadcasting, but good conversation? And it's that kind of relatability. People go, I mean, even if you just send a link to somebody, go, ah, check this out. That's an invitation to a conversation. Right? That's a thing about which you can talk to other human beings about. It's a point of connection. It's a social object. I've picked it up. I've carried it to you. And let's talk about this. And that's what things on the internet are. So if you want to use the internet in order to uh, connect with other human beings in a way that might make them want to give you money, the way you do that is by being interesting. And, and the definition of interesting is not necessarily being a novelty but actually giving people things that you can concretely have conversations about. I mean, there, there are all sorts of ways of doing this. You know, if, you, if you're, let's say you're a beatboxer who juggles, right? That's interesting because that's the guy who's a beatboxer who juggles, right? And so people can easily tell that story and they can communicate it to other people. But this has always been true. People, you know, particularly with press, if you want to get a couple of inches of, of press in the community newspaper, uh, band plays gig in pub, nobody's going to write about that. Bass player gets head stuck in a chair, you, you've got, you know, somebody's going to tell that story. Uh, and so you've got to kind of, and it doesn't have to be silly. I mean, it can just be 
whatever is interesting about you, whatever is meaningful to you, whatever makes people go, you've got to check out this band, they're amazing. This is what I like about them, let me tell you. If they can tell them in a sentence, so much the better. Or if they can show a video, so much the better. Or if they can link to uh, an embedded SoundCloud clip or a Bandcamp album or whatever it is, that's a thing that they can share and they can take and they can listen to and they can watch and they can talk about. Because it's the point at which they talk about it where it becomes meaningful and useful. And then get out of the way. Let them give you some money. You know, give them whatever mechanisms they need in order to do that. Don't stop them from having your stuff. That's absurd. Uh, I mean, this is one of the, the, the weird things that the major record labels do. Is, well, if you're going to listen to it at all, you can only listen to 30 seconds. Right? 30 seconds is barely enough to recognize a tune, let alone get to like it. Um, and particularly, I mean, independent music, your problem is not piracy. Your problem is obscurity. Right? That's the thing you want to get over. You want people to have conversations about you. You want people talking about you. You want people to have things of yours that you can share and take away and use and, and those sorts of things. So the, kind of, the point at which me being all kind of theoretical and philosophical about, yes, the, the, the internet is a conversational space, uh, the instruction that you should take away from that is, I'm going to go and be interesting so people have conversations. I'm going to get involved in conversations so people have conversations. I'm not going to shout at people and say, check out my stuff, but no, you can't listen to it until you give me money. Um, what you're going to do is go, here it is. Let's have a conversation about it. Yeah, have some more. Yeah, give this to your friends. By the way, if you want to pay for it, this is what it costs. This is where you can get it. Let's make it as easy as possible as I can for you to have this, and away you go. So, because this is a conversation, and not just a guy in the corner of the room being shouting into a microphone, um, Thomas said you guys might have had some questions or some comments or some things that you might have brought with you that you want to have conversations about, or things that have just occurred to you while I'm talking. It would be quite good to sort of have that to feed off, because, like I say, this was very short notice. This is an unprepared speech. This is just a rant. So I'd quite like to get interrupted at this point with something you guys want to know. Yeah? From your experience, I mean, uh, social sharing is a good thing of songs and stuff like that, but yeah, there's something called uh, like uh, the wallet variant. Even if somebody likes your music, if he can get it for free, uh, I, don't, I mean, how can you motivate him to afterwards give money? You can't. That, that's a simple answer. You can't. You can't make somebody give you money. Um, it, there's not this, if they can get it for free, they can get it for free. There, there is nothing you can do to stop somebody having what you make for nothing. That, that horse is bolted, right? That, so that's not the problem that you want to solve. The problem that you want to solve is, how do I sell them things that they already have on their iPod? How do I be that meaningful that they want to give me money for something that they already own? And it's a really interesting problem to want to solve. But there are, there are all sorts of things along the lines of gratitude, for instance. Like if somebody is so thankful to you for making the music that they make, they want to do whatever they can to support you, to be involved, uh, if they have their name on your next release, or if they have uh, some kind of involvement, or even a thank you on your website, or and one of the things that um, I, I work with Bandcamp, which is why I keep mentioning it. Um, and uh, one of the things that Bandcamp's just done is they've, they've said, oh, Have you guys seen the fan pages? So now all of the things that I've bought on Bandcamp show up on my fan page. None of the things that I got for free, just the things that I paid for. And so I've got this profile there that says, this is me. This is my, my personal taste through music that I've liked enough to actually pay money for. And not only that, but every time I've done that, my face appears on the page of the person who's selling that music. And that kind of, I mean, it's really, there's a weird sort of self-centeredness uh, about me that that appeals to. I want my face to be on the page of the band that I like. You know, I like that. Um, and that sort of mechanism in place is a really cool thing to do because what that means is you're not just, I've got the music, I'm going to run away and oh, they'll never see me again and they're not going to get any of my money. It's like I'm actually involved in this process where this person is making this music that I love. And that's, a, I mean, that from an incentive perspective is not, I mean, it completely flips it from you can't have this until you give me money to have it, have it, you know, just, just do what you like with it. And if you want to be involved in this process, here is a way in which you can be helpful. Uh, and I think that's a completely different dynamic and a much more personal connection, a much more uh, proactive and a much more gratifying thing than just being the guy who turned up 
paid money on the counter and disappeared again. You know, I'm now involved in the artistic thing that you do. But this is the thing you've got to remember. What you guys do is amazing to most people. Right? Most people can't do what you do. And it's glamorous and it's exciting and it's, you know, uh, it's this kind of creative, artistic and, and magical thing that most people never get to be involved in in any way. And now, instead, of, except as a, as a <coughs> passive customer that uh, is kind of in a mass-produced fashion, you know, I'm going to turn up to an HMV and I'm going to hand over five quid and I'm going to take away a CD, that band's never going to know whether I did that or not. Not only that, they're not going to care whether I did that or not. It's going to make zero impact on Adele's life if I buy her CD or download it. It's just like zero, right? But if I came and I listened to your music and I liked it and I gave you money, and I got an email from you going, thanks for the money, hope you like the record, and my face appears on your page, and I come to your gig, and that's a, and like, at an independent scale, particularly, that's a really meaningful connection with something that is, without wanting to be too kind of romantic and whimsical about it, it's beautiful. It it's really is, it's, it's a really lovely thing. That you make lovely things, I like lovely things, let's get together and do stuff which is cool in a way that makes both of us feel great. Uh, you feel great because you can eat. And I feel great because I feel like I've contributed to that process that enables you to do these things. And for me, as a, as a fan of all sorts of independent music, um, I mean, I like pop music too, but I, I really appreciate a lot of types of, of music that is basically unsustainable at a corporate level. I mean, I like avant-garde jazz from Norway. And, th I mean, there is no kind of smart business plan that says this is what we should do for a living. We should make and release, you know, avant-garde jazz in Norway. And yet, there are enough people who find that meaningful and exciting enough to, to make that a worthwhile thing to do. It's meaningful and you can make a living at it, which is really cool. Um, so, yeah, my answer to you is you can't make people buy what you want, but you can let them and you can re reward that as well, which I think is a really good thing to do. So, how uh, important do you think physical formats are in all of this in terms of rewards? It utterly, utterly depends. Um, if you have an audience that values physical Excuse things... Me, can you please repeat the question? Oh, the question, the question is, are physical things of any value in that relationship? Uh, in terms of rewarding your, your, your fans. Um, I buy vinyl. I don't buy CDs. Um, and I spend way too much money on vinyl. I, I've got records that I haven't listened to yet. Um, but that's my thing. And I'm not saying that that's the model. That's just, if you want me to buy your stuff, make vinyl. Um, so what you need to do is find out about your fans and, and your audiences and, and what is meaningful to them. Do they want postcards? Do they want posters? Do they want USB sticks? Do they want CDs? Do they... I mean, I'm never going to buy a CD. It is just never going to happen. I don't own one. Um, I used to own lots, but then I moved to the other side of the world and I got rid of them and I've never replaced them. I only buy vinyl or downloads. Um, and I've got lots and lots of downloads, many of which I paid for, a lot of which I haven't. Um, and I've got lots and lots of vinyl. And that's me. But it's your job as somebody who's trying to find out how to reward your fans, to go, what is it that they want? It might be experiences. They might want to hang out with you and have dinner. They might want to, you know, they might want to pay to go and play mini golf with you, or they might want to buy a seven-inch single with another band that they also like on the flip side. So you get all of their audience as well. Um, it, yeah, it totally depends. <laughs> there are more questions. Yeah? Could you tell me a bit more about Bandcamp? It's a place where people can sell their music or let people download it or hear it. That's basically it, it's a profile. Can you do downloads for free? You can do downloads for free. You do a certain number of downloads for free, and quite a lot, but what it's not intended to be is a place where major record labels can do promo. So um, there, there is a limit on the number of uh, free downloads you can do unless you pay for more. Um, so if you want to use it as a way to give your music away, I think it's up to 500, the first 500 downloads are free, and then over that you can pay more to, to get free downloads. But as soon as you charge for it, they're not free downloads anymore. But one of the mechanisms between that is you can sell the music for pay what you want. And this is a really, really successful mechanism for Bandcamp. So you can set the minimum price at zero, and then the, the price that people pay is zero pounds or more. And then there's a box that comes up saying, how much do you want to pay? And they have to type the zero in if they want to make it for free. 
and then they put their email address in and their postcode so you can have them on their mailing list uh, if you want to do that. But, but ultimately, they get a point at which they can make a decision. And what's really interesting is a lot of people make the decision to go, you know what, I'm going to pay a couple of quid. And you know, since I'm paying a couple of quid for a PayPal transaction, let's make it five. And so it's really interesting, like, of all of the, uh, the pay what you want transactions on Bandcamp, something like half or possibly even more pay more than was asked for. So you can set a, limit of, a, a bottom limit of five quid, let's say. Here's my album, it's five pounds or more. Half of the people who buy it will pay more than five pounds for it, which is a really interesting dynamic. Um, and the other, the other interesting statistic with Bandcamp is, is um, unlike iTunes, where people tend to buy individual tracks, on Bandcamp, but just because of the experience of it and the way that it's presented and laid out, and because it's made easy to do this, albums outsell individual tracks five to one. And so you don't have this kind of, I mean, you can actually put together a collection of works in the way that an artist will do a, uh, like a, a visual artist will do an exhibition. This is how I think about albums. It's like these are a collected group of uh, thematically linked works that fit together as a whole. That's what I want to communicate with you. It's not here is your favourite song. Because you think of uh, an album like OK Computer, right? If you're buying that as individual tracks, there are a few that you wouldn't pay for, but which add to the overall impact of that record substantially. Um, so there is that kind of the opportunity to make something that is meaningful to you and your audience as a whole and make that communicable. So basically the idea of Bandcamp is it's a way that you can sell people your recordings. That's basically it. In a way that's nice, uh, in a way that unlike MySpace you cannot screw up the design. Uh, and, and it's just, it's intuitive and it's, uh, it's easy to use for you and for your fans and it's just, yeah, uh, I, I'm a, I mean, I rant about it because I'm a massive fan of it and I'm involved in it because I'm a massive fan of it. But I'm also, uh, the, the guys who set it up, um, Ethan Diamond is, is uh, kind of the, the key figure behind it, he got in touch with me and said that uh, some of the ideas for Bandcamp came from the 20 Things ebook that I wrote, which was really lovely. Which is why I was invited to kind of be on board and, and part of the advisory service. What well, advisory service? Advisory board. I think it's three of us maybe. Um, but but that connection with this is how people make sense from music, and particularly independent music. This is a way in which you can take this and share it because everything on Bandcamp is embeddable as well. If somebody wants to tell their friends about it on their blog. They can actually put your album on their blog with a play button that people can listen to the whole album. But there's a buy link there all the time where, you know, actually this is really good. I'm going to go and listen to this more, or I'm going to share it with my friends, or I'm actually going to go and buy it. Um, and so there is that kind of shareability and that kind of use of it as a social object as well, which is kind of useful. So have a look at it, have a play with it. Um, if you go to the bandcamp.com front page, not only will you see the, the current top five sellers, uh, you'll also see down the right you'll have the staff picks. And you'll also see a live feed of everything on the website that's selling as it sells. So every, everything, it's like kind of regularly updating, this just sold for this, this just sold for that, this just sold for five pounds more than was asked for, this, you know, and you can link through and go, that looks interesting, what is it? But at the same time, you can put your own stuff up on there as well. And you have that kind of direct engagement with your, uh, with your audience. And the good thing about it, I think, is that they take a 15% cut, for the most part, on average. I mean, there are, if you sell over, I think it's 5,000 US dollars worth a year, you get a reduced rate of 10%, but 15% um, but they take. Unlike the 40-something percent that iTunes takes, unlike whatever a record label would take, unlike, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But also, what it means is, they don't make money unless you do. So everything that Bandcamp does is about trying to make you money so that they can make money. And I think that's a really nice position to be in, rather than something like Spotify, which is completely uh, opaque. There's no way of knowing how they make money or how the number of plays that you have relates to what their profit is and the rest of it. It's really simplistic, you know, you got a cut of what I made. And so I made some money and you made some money, everybody's happy. I think that's kind of a really nice and, and frankly ethical way of, of conducting your business, which is kind of cool. So yeah, I like it for all sorts of reasons, but yeah, check it out. Somebody else. Andrew, have you got anything to say? Um, I'm really crazy on what Beck's just done with his sheet music thing. What, what, what do you think about that? I think the fact that we're talking about it is, is the, the interesting thing. 
I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like five years ago, the interesting thing was band that you've heard of gives album for free online, right? Front page in The Guardian virtually. You know, it's like really big news. You know what wasn't big news? Second band that you've heard of gives away their album for free. Um, so this, do you guys, have you heard of, I mean, this is old news now, but the million dollar homepage. Yeah. Right, okay, there was this thing that happened a long time back. In the, in the dim dark days, maybe six seven years ago, somebody made a web page essentially, and they, they calculated a number of pixels, a million pixels, and you could buy those pixels for a dollar each, and you could put whatever logo or advertising you wanted on it for that much money. So it's like you wanted 10 pixels by 10 pixels, just a tiny little square, that was going to be $100. Uh, and you could put your logo on it, or your message, or whatever it happened to be. So, of course, as soon as Coca Cola put their message up there, Pepsi needed a bigger one. And then, you know, Ford needed theirs, and then Starbucks needed theirs, and everybody's logo was going off this million dollar homepage. And within three weeks, this university kid who'd just come up with this really simple concept had a million dollars in his bank account from all of these major, because everybody was looking, who's going to this website, who's paying money, everybody's looking at these logos and the advertisement. You know what didn't work? The second, the second million dollar homepage. Somebody else said, that's a great idea, I'm going to do that as well. So, <coughs> like, I mean, the, the big example is a perfect example of that because I don't know if you know the story. What he's done is he's released an album on sheet music only, um, and this is somebody who is really quite famous in the, in the grand scheme of things. His new album you can't listen to unless you can sight read music and play it on a piano or get some friends together or you know uh, or you've heard somebody on the radio having a go at it or or whatever. I mean, it, it only exists in sheet music, which is interesting because that's from a previous age of media. We're in the digital age now, before that was the electric age, before that was the print age. The main way in which money used to change hands over music was people would walk into a shop, they would pay for a piece of paper, they would carry it home, they would play it badly on the piano. Um, and that was replaced by the new music industry, which destroyed, in inverted commas, the previous music industry, which was sheet music. So, it's really interesting that the, the thing that Beck has done has given us something to talk about. But it's fully interactive as well, and he will be recording his own version, and he will be having the, the fantastic mix album of Everybody's Global. It's going to run and run, and it's lovely, and it's really imagine. Uh, really, that, uh, that's that's the thing about it. It, it is, it's oh, imaginative, it's and it's thoughtful, so, yes. and, and yeah. So, but the, the important part of it is that it's a social object, that it's, it's, it's something that is interesting that we are having a conversation about because of its interestingness. Um, so, I guess the best thing that you could do is, one, be meaningful, but two, surprise us. You know, come up with something um, innovative or creative or, I mean, this is what you guys do, right? You're creative people. Um, so, have interesting ideas. That's what I do. So, I, mean, I only make, like, say, a couple of pence per play on Spotify, but I still put my band on there because, one, I'll our distribution label wants to, and two, because it's kind of nice to be up there, people want to get us on there. But do you think it's still important to have as many fingers and as many pies as, as possible, um, even if you're making much money out of those pies? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of torn over Spotify. I've left Spotify, I know people have closed and removed their music from Spotify, for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but as a general principle, if you don't have a problem with how Spotify makes money, or the fact, I mean, the, the bit that I had an issue with, I'll, I'll be honest with you, is uh, that because in order to get the licenses for the major record label stuff, Spotify had to give, and this is the, the incentive that they use, you give us the license of the music, we'll give you equity in the company. Right? So the major record labels are co-owners of Spotify, which means that everything that makes money for Spotify makes money for the major record labels. Which means that all of the artists who are on Spotify, whether they're on a major record label or not, are making money for the major record labels. Which to me seems like a bit of a swindle. Um, however, from a pragmatic perspective, where are people going that want to listen to my music? How can I easily let them do that? How can I let them build playlists that include my music? How can I make it shareable? Yeah, why not? Um, there, um, I don't see any harm in it, that's for sure. Um, getting pennies for something that is of very, very little kind of um, friction or engagement on your part, that doesn't seem like a bad thing. The pennies aren't actually the important part of the story. The important part of the story is, can people listen to my music? Do they know who I am? Can I share it with their friends? And those sorts of things. So um, I'm not going to do it because it's only making me pennies is the wrong reason to not be on Spotify, yes. I would say.
Um, We've had people on Facebook page going like, oh, my friends make a Spotify playlist, and oh my god, such and such track was absolutely amazing. I had to find the rest of your music. So right, so exactly. the, the point at which they have to find the rest of your music, I think is where the problem is, and you need to step in and go, let me show yeah. you. This is where it is. It's on Bandcamp, of course. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> now you can listen to the whole album, and you can download <coughs> it, and you can pay for it, and you can you know pay more if you want to. Um, and here's the vinyl, or here's the you know the USB stick, or you know the party at my house, whichever it is they you want them to pay for. Um, I think the main problem that most bands have is they have one-off customers. Let's say they have one-off fans. So somebody comes here, listens to your music, and then just goes and disappears. So it's it's an important part of build, building a fan base, keeping those people coming. What do you think is the best way to build this team up of people? Keep having a conversation. I mean that's that's the thing. If, if somebody comes to your gig and then they go away again and they went, that was all right, then that's probably all they really wanted from it. And you can't make them continue to like your music. Uh, even if they had a really good time, they probably had a really good time because they were with their friends or because they were drinking a lot of alcohol. Um, but if they're genuinely interested in your music, give them an opportunity to connect with you, to have an on board, or take people's names on a phone or whatever. Get their, get their phone number so you can text them or get their email address so you can put them on a mailing list. And they can opt out, right? They can always kind of, later they can say, actually this isn't for me after all. But you've got to have this ongoing dialogue, whether it's they come to your website and there's something new every time they go there, or, you know, here is a new thing that I'd like you to listen to. I mean, in the, in the 20 Things ebook, I, I had this, um, one of the things was reward and incentivize. So don't just, you know, don't just put up a web page that's always the same and expect people to keep coming back. Give them a reason to come back. Give them something that will incentivize their engagement, something that m will make them want to stay on the mailing list. You know, by the way, since you're on the mailing list, here's a code for a free download of you know, a live gig that we did last week, or something along those lines. You, so you've got something that you, you, you're not just kind of, uh, here I am again, please give me money. Here I am again, please give me money. It's, like, it's an ongoing conversation. You contribute to that as much as they do. And I think that's kind of the, um, the thing. But you can't, like I say, you can't, force people to be your friend. Uh, the word friend has kind of got sort of diminished in terms of its sort of resonance uh, in the age of Facebook and MySpace and Twitter and the rest of it. But, um, but I do think that this, if you aim for that, if you, if you actually aim for other human beings that like you as a human being and as a creative person and as somebody who sort of puts music out in the world. I mean, that's the thing. People talk about music as being self-expression. People like the self that's doing that expressing, they're far more likely to want to hear the thing that, that comes out of that. So I think this kind of being engaging and being interesting, and I know that's not everybody's cup of tea. There are some people who are shy, there are people who don't want to be in the spotlight, there are, you know, I can't imagine their motivation, to be honest with you. I mean, the fact that there's a light pointing at me and I have a microphone in my hand, I'm at home, this is what I do. But there are other people who would rather not have that at all. Um, and the internet isn't their friend in that respect. You know, the, the, the internet, favors the gregarious. That it's not the internet's job to solve your music business problems. But it's a tool that you can use to engage with other human beings. And if you're good at engaging with other human beings, it's a tool that you'll use really well. And if you're not good at engaging with other human beings, then you might have difficulty with it just as you'd have difficulty with a telephone or a fax machine. Um, but it's available to you. And then I talk about affordances, technological environments, allow you to do things. Affordances is kind of a weird word from psychology. It basically means if there's a room and that room has a tabletop, has a table in it, then tabletop dancing can happen. That is one of the affordances of that environment. The table doesn't make you dance, but it enables that tabletop dancing to happen. So the internet has certain things about it that have affordances that allow you to do things like have conversations with people, to email them, to engage with them, and to, to be their friend, I guess. And that's um, and, but how you do that is only about who's your audience, what do they like to do, where do they like to hang out, uh, what do you make, how does that make meaning for them, and then you have to join the dots using the tools that are available to you. It's not, you know, here is the, the internet success kit set, although there is actually a formula for, you know, music business success on the internet. Um, step one is be fucking amazing. Okay. Step two is let people hear your music, step three is let people buy your music, um, you know, and, and so on. But most people forget about step one. I mean, I was talking to Thomas before, we were talking about, you know, bands just starting out and they've got their, their Facebook page and they've got their, you know, their website set up and they've got their, you know, their Twitter account and they're adding people and they're following people. 
and I haven't thought to, you know, write any songs or have any rehearsals. Um, and so that the first step is, in order to, to get people to like and buy your music, make it amazing. And if you're saying stuff on Twitter and getting stuff out on Facebook and, uh, and, and you're kind of promoting it and the rest of it, and you're not really getting any traction, maybe your music's shit. I mean, it's a possibility. I don't, I don't want to make that assumption about anybody in this room, but if, if people don't like what you do, go away until it's better. You know, work on it, make it more meaningful for people, or get it to the right people. I mean, that can be a possibility as well. But blaming the internet for you not being successful, which a lot of people do, is nonsense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but it's your job to be interesting, and then there's an environment within which you get to share that interestingness. And interestingness is the currency of the internet. And it, you know, th there is nothing brilliant on the internet that will not get found and shared. It just doesn't happen. Um, so your job is to be the amazing thing. And that's kind of that's the step one that, that most people kind of struggle with. So something related to that. What are the three things that picked your interest the last month? And you were like, whoa, I'm going to share that. Hmm. In the last month? Yeah. Uh, well, because I'm one of the staff, in inverted commas, at Bandcamp, uh, I get to do and contribute to the staff picks. So there are people that I talk to on Twitter, so I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a Twitter fan, um, and I like that conversational space. It appeals to me and it, and it kind of suits me. So when I've done staff picks, it's usually stuff that I've checked out because these are people that I'm already having conversations with. That I've got to know them and I know that they're musicians and you know what, I'll check out your music because you're really interesting and you say really cool things. And I've been really impressed by them. One of them, there's an album by Emily Baker, uh, which I put last week as, as staff pick. Now Emily Baker is not somebody that most people would stumble across. I mean, she, she has an audience, she has fans, she makes a living in her music. Um, but I was blown away, like really, this is an incredible record, possibly one of the best uh, records of this kind that I've heard in years. It's just, it's a beautiful acoustic singer-songwriter album and I haven't heard anything like it for a long time. And that absolutely blew me away. But the reason that I listened to it in the first place was because we were talking about stuff. We were talking about, you know, politics. Um, and so it's these kinds of things, these kinds of connections that, that really grab me for music. I mean, the, the big thing's interesting. There, there are all sorts of interesting things, but um, to be honest, what's interesting to me is not of interest. What's interesting to you is of interest. Um, and what's interesting to your fans is of interest. So, I mean, yeah, I could give you lots of examples of records that I like, and I can tell you the story about how I found out about those records, but, but that kind of, that interestingness needs to come from the kind of the subculture that surrounds whatever it is you do. I mean, not everybody's going to be able to kind of have a conversation with me about politics and then get me to listen to and like their music, because I might not like their music. Um, but, you know, so that, that's not the recipe, is what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, uh, find ways to be interesting with your own community and your own subcultures and those sorts of things, you know, I would say. Yeah. What do you think about promoting your music on Facebook at the moment? Um, that's a really good question. I should know more about Facebook than I do, but I, I quit Facebook just over a year ago. And I haven't been they honest changed since. it. Apparently they ch <laughs> they've changed about nine times since yeah, I did. You have to pay now. Of right, so... About 10% so, of people on there see yeah. posts. Which is, which is kind of weird. I mean, I, I can, there are two perspectives on this. Uh, one is that uh, anything you put up on Facebook is not your thing, it's Facebook's thing. They own that. Um, and so, I, I mean, personally, I would use Facebook as a way to direct people away from Facebook. Um, I would, here is a link to something that you might want to listen to. Um, but the fact that there is that promoted stuff now, I mean, if you upload a photo to Facebook, that's Facebook's photo, that's not your photo. Um, but if you put your photo on something like Flickr, or you put it on your own website, and then you link to it from Facebook, then there is a way of taking that audience and showing them the same thing without it kind of being locked in that environment. Um, there is no getting out of, uh, there's no getting content out of Facebook, but you can get content in, if you see what I mean. Um, but that kind of, that 10% of the people who have elected to see your stuff, uh, are the only ones who are going to be allowed to see your stuff. It seems like kind of Facebook are uh, double dipping and, and charging for it twice. Although, I'm, I have some sympathy with the argument that, you know, well, this is the service that they provide and, and these are the terms and conditions that you've agreed to and, uh, and, and you know, and it used to be a lot harder to get your stuff in front of other people. 
Um, it sounds to me like Facebook has deliberately broken what they do in order that they could charge you to fix it in individual instances, which is, I, I think, it's a bit shit, to be honest with you. Um, but if it works, I mean, if that's the thing, I'm, really, I'm a pragmatist, right? So if giving Facebook money results in you getting the things that you want in the way that you want, then give them some money. Um, if it doesn't, then don't. And I would trial it. You know, see what works for you and what doesn't, and, and leave it at that. But I wouldn't, you know, no, that's not true. I did. Um, I was going to say, I wouldn't take an ethical position on it because, you know, you just, if, you, if you just want to make some money out of your music, then you just kind of use the tools that are there and that are available to you. But, of course, um, you know, there are ethical implications for that, and you need to work out what those are for yourself. And I, I wasn't comfortable with Facebook because it felt like a horrible bar that I didn't want to hang out with. I liked all my friends and everything. I just didn't want to be, you know, it's like being in a really noisy sports bar with ads all over the walls and stuff like that. So I tried to find other social spaces that I could hang out with my friends and then invite them to come and share that space with me. And not all of them came, but some of them did. And I'm, I'm happier in the bars that aren't Facebooky uh, than I am in the bars that are. So I'm no longer on Facebook and uh, there's, a few, there's a few services I don't use anymore. Um, I'm not on Spotify and various other, but that's not, you know, my, my kind of personal reasons for doing that it's just my way of saying, I don't really know because I don't really know very much about Facebook anymore. And I used to and I wish I did, but there's no way to actually find out what Facebook is up to without actually participating in it. So um, that's, my, uh, that's my excuse for not having a very good answer to what you have to say. But I just figure out what works for you and then do that. That feels like a natural conclusion. Is there any kind of last? <laughs> Is there any other question? You can say uh, some, uh, about uh, radio, for example. Um, uh, it's, it's still like, uh, do you think it's, it's still very important to get into radio, or, or, or just if you work uh, well, like, I don't know, with this kind of websites, like um, this one, Bandcamp, or I don't know, like, um, or if you have your YouTube channel and this, is, is, what do you think is most important? like, like um, is radio important, I guess, is the, is the question. Um, and yeah, radio is important. Um, something like 98% of people in the country turn on the radio at some point in the week, um, when they get into the car, or when they're making breakfast, or whatever it might be. But not everybody makes music that goes on the radio. Right? Not everybody, and and ne that was never true. So there, there are certain types of music, and there is a certain kind of, uh, I guess, lottery winning bar that you've got to cross over in order to get playlisted. I mean, Radio 1, for instance, I think adds maybe one song to their playlist a week. You know how many new songs a week get made and sent to Radio 1? So the, the kind of the odds aren't good anyway if you're looking at mainstream uh, popular music radio. And particularly, if, you, if you're in a heavy metal band, the chances of Radio 1 playlisting your song are, are so slim that it's probably not worth wasting any time and energy on, but that's not to say that the things that are radio and things that are like radio are not worthwhile, because they absolutely are. Um, but there might be a podcast, or uh, a streaming radio station, or a radio station in another country that really champions the kind of thing that you do. And you go, look, I, I really love what you guys do, here's our band, here's our new single, love it if you played it. Because I would rather target an audience of 500 people who are interested in what I do than an audience of five million who don't give a shit. Because the, the, the kind of attraction that you're likely to get from that is so much better. And you're going to be far more meaningful. And, and particularly if you're an independent act and you go with something small. Let's say there's, there's somebody in your street who does a, a weekly podcast of new music I found on the internet. And you send them your stuff and go, look, this is, this is what it is and this is, this is who we're about. And by the way, if you want to chat to us about it, let's do an interview and so on. And the fact that somebody who's making a podcast that's got an audience of 500 people could do an interview with the musicians that they're playing on their radio show. I mean, they're going to be excited to do that. They're going to give you all this time to kind of promote what you do and they're going to, they're going to feel like there's some sort of ownership over, over what you do and, and their audience will be connected with it and it just kind of makes sense. So um, this, this whole thing about is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is that the model to use? Is that not the model to use? It depends, and uh, it's it's kind of it's complicated. But but if it's something that's pragmatic and useful to you, and you can find a way to make it work, and there's something that, that's meaningful and a good fit to you, and it isn't going to be 
this m massive lottery with a really, really expensive ticket, then yeah, go for it, I would say. Yeah, Jeff. Um, I think Listening to all that's been said, obviously I've come mid midway through, but don't you feel a lot of what bands and musicians are doing is they're too interested in their image rather than looking at saying, well, hey, do I like what I do? Because if you don't like what you do, hey, why is anybody else going to like it? Well, for sure. I mean, uh, again, I mean, image is one of these things that, that you know comes down to... It depends on who you are and what your music is and the rest of it. I mean, some, I mean, let's be honest, some types of music are mostly image, right? Um, and some types of music, um, the image doesn't matter at all. Like, I, I know people who are improvisational musicians that do these kind of hour-long, noodly uh, extravaganzas that are just kind of made up on the spot. And it doesn't matter if they turn up in their slippers, you know? Um, because that's not what it's about. Because the kind of beard strokey audience that you're going to get at something like that don't care what you wear. But if you're in front of a bunch of 14 year old screaming girls, you're going to want to wear tight skinny jeans and look really cool with a you know fancy haircut. Um, and that's part of the music because the music is, is cultural and it's about making meaning for those, those people by by identifying with their culture and uh, and. Culture is different for different people, and, and different cultures have different musics. And you know, like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be in a reggae band, I'm probably not gonna be with a with a short haircut and a suit. You know, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna have dreads, and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna look the part, and I'm gonna be wearing the right clothes, and I'm gonna be using the right colours on my album sleeve, and all of those things are all connected. They're not separable. You can't actually separate the music and go, well, that's the music, and that's the image, and this is the business, because they're all one thing. Um, but there are some things that. You know, if you only focus on the music, chances are nobody's even going to hear you. If you only focus on the image, chances are when they do, they're not going to like it very much. So I think these things are all kind of, you've got to find where the balance is. But if my job is guitarist and heavy metal band, I'm going to get really, really good at shredding. You know, that's going to be my thing, and I'm going to focus on that. And what I wear, this is what I wear. Um, and if I need to wear something that's slightly different to go on stage, to be part of an ensemble, to, to kind of have a, a particular look, that's fine. Somebody else can choose those for me or we can kind of get together and make those decisions. But yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's complicated and, you know, it depends. But in a nutshell, it makes most sense to be the best at what you can control yourself. I.e. if you're a really, say, really good guitarist, yeah, concentrate on being a good guitarist and if people see what you do, they're going to think, hey, well, whatever image you have, they will have got that. Right? Yeah, well, this is, this is kind of, there's another way in which I approach this, which is, uh, a lot of people go, but yeah, I, I'm only a musician, and I don't know about marketing, and I don't know about graphic design, and I don't know about web development, and I, and I don't know how to do all those things, so I need a record label. And my answer is, no, you don't necessarily. What you need is people who know how to do those things, so build your team. And if you've got a specialism, and th there are things, I mean, I, I divide the world into three things. There are things that I'm really good at, there are things that I'm not good at, but I'm interested in and would like to be good at, and there are things about which I don't care at all. Pay people to do the things about which you don't care at all, or you know, get them involved or incentivize them or let them be a part of what you can do. Learn to do the things that you're interested in, but focus on the things that you love. And that's kind of that's a really good yeah way of breaking it down, I would say. Thanks. So going on from image as well, how important do you think music videos are for men and YouTube and stuff like that? Because I know on YouTube you have like live videos and whatever. Um, but how important is doing a music video? Seven. Is the answer to that. Um, I, you know, it's again for me. Uh, I don't think I've seen a music video for an album that I bought in the last couple of years. Um, but I'm not everybody's target audience, and so for lots of people, music video is the key to it. It's how I make meaning from it. It's how I understand it. You know, those visual images are the thing that I share with my friends, that I associate with, that I get screen grabs and posters of, and you know the rest of it. So. Yeah, I mean, it, again, uh, music videos favour the photogenic, um, and most of the artists I like aren't particularly. Um, but that's you know, um, that comes down to your target audience. What what what's meaningful to them? What will they share? What social objects can you make that are of interest? Um, and maybe the interesting thing is we're a band that never makes music videos. Or maybe your interesting thing is we're the band that makes music videos for you know, 
for when we make our breakfast. You know, it's like it could be whatever, but if it's if it's a useful tool for you and it's something that you can do and it's something you have access to, I mean, I wouldn't again, I wouldn't go broke over any of these things because they're the most important thing in the world. But if it's something that you want to do and you've got the ability to do that, go for it. Yeah, and, and if it doesn't work, do something else next time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't think they have as much impact as they used to. I mean, I remember being in Canada looking at much music and they would premiere a video and it would be a huge thing. Yeah. And now because none of these music stations actually play music videos anymore, it's all on YouTube and the internet. But people are too busy looking at videos of cats sleeping and, you know, ridiculous <laughs> images. You know, I, I'd rather cats. share that. Cats are interesting. Cats, cats love merchandise, isn't that good enough for you? Yeah, exactly. If you've got cats on your merchandise and you don't yeah. have cats in your video, there is something exactly. like if, if you've got a cat connection and you're thinking about making music videos and you don't make music videos with cats in them, there's something wrong with your video. By the way, uh, Andrew, this is their t-shirt, this is their merchandise, it has a cat on it. Yeah, yeah. This is so I think they get it right. Yeah, yeah, no, I think they do, but I think what they need to do if they go, you know, we, we, we do stuff with cats in it, what shall we put on the internet? I don't think there's a conversation even there to be had. You know, that's what people like on the internet, exactly. obviously. So yeah. In fact, our next single is called Black Cats and Guillotines. So, there you go. Well, yeah. as long as you don't actually put those two things together in a video, <laughs> you should be fine. I think we are to be serious when we say that. Like yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what's your advice to get in contact for, with a uh, record label? Like, um, my, my question is, my, my advice is think about why you would want to do that. Um, but what is it you want to get out of that? What is it you think record labels do that you can't do? Uh, and what is it that you're prepared to sign away in order to get the things that they do? I mean, for some people, having a record label is a really cool thing to do. But I would say for 90 plus, maybe 99% of people, particularly in the, in the independent music business, how can I get a record deal is the wrong question. How, you know, how can I be connected with a record label is the wrong question. Um, it's the worst finance deal typically in the world. For most record labels, particularly the large ones. Um, so if you want, if you want it because you want some money in order to make the thing, don't go back one. Don't borrow some money from your mates or your dad or whatever. But, but avoid because the way advances work. I don't know if you know this about record labels, but if you get an advance from a major record label, that is a loan that they've made to you that your job is to pay back, um, and they loan it to you to buy something with, which is a recording, and. They own the recording. So it's like going to a bank and they're loaning you money to buy a car that they own, that you don't own. Um, and you don't get any money from your record until you've recouped, in inverted commas. And, and recoupment means you've paid back all of the loan before you start getting any royalties. But there's another twist to it, because any marketing budget that gets spent on it, or any promotion, or any TV, or the rest of it, that gets added to the advance that they've sent you, even if they've paid it themselves and not given it to you. So you've got to recoup that as well. So there was something, uh, I think it was Polygram, when they sold, uh, there was something like five artists in the entire history of Polygram who had ever recouped. You know, and it, and like, it was an astonishing number, but I mean, they made money through touring or through merchandise or through um, uh, performance royalties when they got played on the radio and, and all those other things, but not from making records. And in fact, they still owed money on the records. And yes, it is the kind of loan that you can walk away from. If you get out of your record contract not having recouped, you don't have to still pay them the money now that you're a milkman. But the economics of it is really, really broken. I mean, like, in any other industry, it would be labeled corrupt. But, but it, because it's the way that the, uh, the, record label has, uh, the record label industry has developed, that's, that's standard common business practice now. So, those are the sorts of questions you'd ask, and what is it you need them to do? Promote you? What is it, or, or can you not get your records pressed without it? Do they need to be records? Is it distribution? Is it, you know, are there other ways of solving these problems? Is the question that I would ask. And if you come back to it and go, nope, nope, the only way I can do this is with a record label, then approach a record label. Um, how do you get their attention? It'd be amazing. I mean, I, I always think the moment you get a phone call from a major record label saying we want to sign you to our record label, is the moment that you know you don't need them. Because you can do those things without them. You can build your team to do all of the marketing and promotion and distribution or finance or legal or whatever it is you want to do. Yeah, but what about uh, connections from the other parts of the world? You cannot be, they may be 
more experienced than them, so you can use their yeah, roots like, like, like their I say, this, this, this means. Yeah, they, they're an institution because they're an institution, because they've been around for so long, because they have these connections. You know, they can do things more easily than you could do them. Yeah. But that's not going to happen for free. Um, so, so it depends on how much you need that. It depends on what extent you're prepared to go. Because the record deal you get will be atrocious. Like, like criminally atrocious. Um, always get independent legal advice. Especially if you can't afford it. And if you can't afford legal advice, do not sign a record label because you can't afford that record label even more. That would be my advice. Anyway, I'm going to have to go to another thing because I'm, I'm talking at another event. Um, later on today, and I need to I'll do things in between, but right. um, yeah, I... <laughs> if you think of some burning issue you want to get in touch with me about, I am just dubber at gmail.com or dubber on Twitter. Just give me a shout and we'll talk. To be continued. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.